Here with me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, a man who needs no introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, today, we have actor, dancer, and diehard Knicks fan, Lito McCollum. Uh, Lito, how are you doing, Dancer, man? I have no idea why you said dancer. I, I, I have uh, two left feet in my old age, but... <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I know you were a Knicks City dancer. I knew, you know... I, Blowing his spots up early, Jeremy. Blowing that's that's early. better than what I can do. So uh, <laughs> I had to sneak it in there, of course. Uh, but Julita, how you doing? I'm excellent, man. Uh, I just want to say thank you and the team for having me on. Again, I, I said it off air, but I'll say it. My favorite podcast. You know, uh, you guys do an excellent job at at like narrating the scope of this Nick stuff, man. So I'm I'm I'm, 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 I'm I am honored to be here with you all. Well, thank you. We certainly appreciate that. Um, and it's really great. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of The Wire. I know Andrew is as well. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But I think first and foremost, you know, we're going to talk about the Knicks. The Knicks had a crazy offseason. A um, lot went on. Yeah. I'm curious. What were your thoughts on the offseason? I mean, were there, did you have a favorite pickup or... Yeah, um, I, I, first off, I'm just so proud to be a Knicks fan. You know what I mean? I've been a Knicks fan 30 years almost, right? And this season, the Big 15 season, that's what I'll label it, right? The Big 15, the We Here season, was probably one of my favorite seasons to be a part of. And now the, with the off season, man, I'm just so happy we got people. We have a, 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 a front office that knows what they're doing. They care about the players. It's not about the dollars and cents. It's more about camaraderie and chemistry. And I love what we did, man. Kimber Walker... Um, Listen, when you get a hometown guy that knows the city, knows the team, that wants to play here, you I mean, regardless if he goes out like pray let's pray for his knees, right? Let's pray let's pray that, you know, he, he stays healthy the whole season. But if he just gave us like fifteen and five, I'm okay with it because I know he wants to play here and he's gonna give us everything we need every night, right? And then we got Fournier, man, and he's he's a dog. You know what I mean? Like he may not be your your stereotypical dog, but he's a dog. He, we needed a score bad. We needed if the Atlanta series showed you anything, it showed you that we just didn't have enough creation on the shot making tip. And then we got that with Fournier. Uh, I'm sad we had to lose Reggie Bullock. You know, the creator of the Big Fifteen. But I think I think the pickups we had over this off season was just amazing and then i know you probably want to talk about it but the rookies just i'm like i'm team deuce you know what i mean jeremy i'm team deuce over here and and grime showed me enough to say okay we got some guys that they're gonna be situational i'm sure but we got some guys that 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 can help us when needed and um you can't ask for anything more man see i feel like the best thing about being a fan is we can kind of talk ourselves into anything but there's not a whole lot of talking into that we need to do with yeah. this off season. And like, as you're saying with the rookies, like the Knicks traded out and then yeah. down and then down again. And we still love the pickups that they made and they haven't even played a minute of actual NBA basketball exactly. uh, outside of summer league. So yeah, I, I'm with you. It's, it's so great to be able to see these changes and as well, like, you know, yeah, if Kemba's doing 15 and five and he's playing games and, Pulling up, I like I was looking at Mitchell Robinson because he's in the news, of course, yep. uh, and the point guards that he's had to deal with. And to think that he can run pick and roll with Kemba Walker and Evan Fournier, just crazy to me. And I, it's I think, it's awesome. Yeah, I think he's, he's going to be a Tibbs guy. Tibbs likes smart point guards. He likes point guards he can trust. And, we, you know, we was all quickly hive this, this last season and we wanted him to start. And Tip showed you he's stubborn when it comes to his players, his point guards, and who gets the minutes. And I'm so happy that now we have a point guard that can start the game that won't have us down 15 going into the second quarter. And that Tibbs knows, okay, he can trust him. He can fall back a little and worry about other guys. And, man, Kimba's going to do well for us. I really believe that. I think so, too. And especially on that contract, right? Like, he's not a max player. That's all right. He doesn't have to be that either. You got Kimball Walker, man, for, was it, $8 million a year? Like, yep. dude, Kimball Walker sh with bad knees should still be getting at least $15 million, right? And we got him for eight for, was it, two years, and the third is uh, not guaranteed? or 
What's just two years, but, but just still. Just two years, right? Like, come on, man. You can't ask for anything better. And I think William West and Leon and, you know, these guys, they did just an amazing job for sure. And then backing him up, we've got one of your favorite players in Derrick Rose. Come on, man. The Rose, man. The, he's the, the Rose that grew from concrete. Man, I'm just, I don't know why, like, Jeremy, I get emotional watching Derrick Rose play. <laughs> like, like, yo, yeah, right, like, I just remember D. Rose, the MVP year, and like I, I told you off air, he's one of my favorite players. Um, and just to see what he was able to do for, he literally was our team in the playoffs, <laughs> right? And yeah. and now that he's going, he's going to be coming off the bench behind Kemba Walker, oh, man, this our rotations are our our like how the, the Knicks are so deep, and I was trying to look at a bunch of different. I was I was looking at other teams, and I was just trying to see how you know how far they can go. And they can't go that far in their bench. A lot of teams, maybe one handful of teams that can you know go deep in the bench, and the, you know with with the bench that we have. Like, I, if you look at, like, Nick's Twitter, people are more hyped for the bench than they are the starting lineup right now. Like, they can't wait for the bench mob to come in. And we got D-Rose leading it, man. It's, it's, it's going to be a special year. For sure. Is there anything that you would have done differently? You know, I mean, we love what we, they did. But anything in your mind was like, I wish the Knicks had done that. Or, I'm not crazy about this, but I can live with it. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure, man. I don't think I just looking at the landscape and looking at what was out there at that time, looking at the free agents. I think we made the best decisions. We got Evan Fournier on like a super cheap deal. If you look at what like Doug McDermott got, or if you look at what some of these other guys, even even what Kelly Oubre got in in Charlotte. I mean, I wanted Oubre. I'm not gonna lie, I did want Oubre, but then I. Because I just wanted somebody with some um, athleticism that's flashy that maybe can give you some type of jolt on that starting lineup, right? And I, because I think sometimes we played so mature that the other team was able to kind of when on the offensive end they was able to figure us out kind of quick. But when you got a guy like a Ubre, he you know he's so flashy and he's so unorthodox that you just never know what he's willing to do at any given time. I enjoyed that, but. I'm I'm fine with Fournier. You know, Fournier is a, a, a three level score, which is we did not have besides Alec Burks. And you know, Alec Burks does not need to be starting for us, man. He needs to come off the bench and give the, the second unit a jolt. So, to be honest, Jeremy, no, nah, I, I love what we did. Even the Kimba signing because we none of us thought, right? Like I listened to you guys, and none of us even thought of Kimba. At any point of this offseason. Nope. And to get him for $8 million, it's like, I think they get, for me, an A-, minus, you know, an A- minus for this front, this offseason. That's a good grade. I would take that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, how would you compare the, the Brewing Hawks rivalry to the ones that you grew up with, with the Heat, the Pacers, <laughs> the Bulls? It was uh, a little before my time. Yeah. Uh but yes. you lived it. What I was did. it like for you? I did. I did. Um, I don't know if it's there yet, just to be honest, because we just haven't beat them when it matters. <laughs> so I don't know if it's the it's, 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 it's the a real rivalry yet. I think Atlanta's trying to make it one because they're trying to be relevant, right? So they're going to do whatever they can to get some of this New York fan base to talk about them because Knicks for clicks, right? But um, Trey Young is good, man. I just I'm not a Trey Young fan. I've never been a Trey Young fan, right? Like, even when he was in college. So, I, it's going to be real. It's going to be a different ball game for him this season. You can't do all those unnecessary bumps when he goes up for his jumper. It's going to be a tough season when he comes to the Garden, man. The Garden is going to be filled with some dogs. Christmas Day. Kimber Walker's not losing in front of family and friends <laughs> Christmas morning. He will not lose in front of family and friends. So, Trey Young... He needs to be worried this season. Um, but I, shout out to Atlanta, though, man. I love Atlanta, the city itself. And I, I do actually enjoy what the Atlanta Hawks are doing just because they're a young team. But at the same time, it's Knicks tape every day, all day. So, Atlanta, you got a problem, man. You got a problem. And Trey Young, y'all gave J John Collins too much money, FYI. That is <laughs> definitely true. Yeah. 
I, yeah, I feel like, you know, Hawks fans are making this and Knicks fans too. It's, it's, I feel like it's more of a rivalry amongst the fans than it is around yeah. the actual team. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Kemba Walker, he's not losing a big game. He's not at losing MSG. Christmas morning. That, Who especially wants to not lose that? Christmas morning in New York City. He's going to have 400 friends and family in the stands. Yeah. He's not losing. He's not Although, losing. I, I mean, he said only four. It, at the press conference, it's so Christmas, like, Christmas that's true. Day. Rule rule gets broken on Christmas the Day. Rule it's gets broken Christmas Day. Kimba will have seven hundred people from the Bronx in the <laughs> stands, and it's it's going to be game time. So I, I think I don't. I think we are better than Atlanta. We, I mean, even though we we didn't, they didn't have Nate McMillan um, coaching the first game. We won. And then the second game, I believe, is when is that when Trey stubbed his ankle. I think Trey got hurt the third game. The third game. The third yeah. game, yeah. So, I, yeah, it's – I just think we're better than Atlanta, man. I, I really think we're better than the Atlanta Hawks. I think we just have a deeper bench. I know they have a, a great bench as well, but their bench is a little too young, man. Um, there's no – they got Sharif Cooper backing up Trey Young. I don't think – against Derrick Rose, he's going to put him in a blender. You know what I mean? So, I mean, Nerland's Noel – I don't even think they're going to have a, a what's this? Okay. Oh, they're Okongwu. Okongwu. Yeah. I don't think they're even going to have them next season. It's like, they don't really have a, a center coming in. That's going to be able to deal with Nerlens Noel or even Sims. If he ever gets time, it's Atlanta got a problem when it comes to the garden and the New York Knicks. I just want to say that. That's yeah. I, I hope Julius goes off right with Kemba on that game. He has, be, to. He has 40 he's, against them, right? His, his I, season high last season against no. Atlanta. Come on, man. Yeah, and easier looks this time, too. Forget it. Oh, my God. It's <laughs> over for him. <laughs> um, so every Knicks fan with a Twitter account apparently needs to have an opinion on each other following. Uh, RJ Barrett's ceiling. Let's, let's start with there. So okay. RJ Barrett's ceiling. Where do you see RJ's ceiling here? I honestly can see an R.J. Barrett ceiling similar to a Jimmy Butler. I Just give or take. A, a, a leader of a team that can play. I think his defense is just going to get better and better every season, especially under Tom. Um, once he gets – the moment that R.J. Barrett can start to score off the dribble, it is over for the league. I want you to know that. It is over. And I think – you know, he – I just – I need R.J. Barrett to just go in a dark room with every Jimmy Butler tape he can possibly find and just watch it on repeat, right? Because that's, to me, his his ceiling. And um, I think R.J., you know – with my thing with R.J. is he's such a, a mature kid that there's times where he's – thinking so much because he knows the game well. He's thinking so much and it, it keep, it's like a – analysis paralysis moments for him out there. And I just think he needs to let the, the let the game come to him, let it flow. I think he will now that he finally has a point guard. He played with he who must not be named for two yep. seasons. And now he has Kimba Walker to teach him the ropes and to pass him the ball. And I think that's all we were missing with RJ is a point guard that's going to pass him the ball. And I think we're going to see a huge leap in uh, RJ's game this season. Great. Um, Emmanuel quickly ceiling. Ooh, IQ. I just want IQ to start to pass the ball, man. I think he's such an amazing scorer. I just, I, I like stare at IQ when he's playing basketball. He will not look at anybody on the floor. He's like, so for me, I, right now in this moment, his ceiling is Lou Will. His ceiling is uh, a six man that comes in, can give you points in a bunch really quick. Um, you're never going to need him to be the like the go-to scorer on your team, but he's going to just make the, the 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 opposing team's bench look like little kids in the park because he, they can't stop him. And I think once he's, you know, I don't I don't believe he's a point guard. I, I don't. I think he's he's a true shooting guard. And I think we we know he can score, right? We know he can shoot the ball. I just want him to be able to trust his teammates, right? And I don't, I'm not even going to blame Summer League because I know they Tom gave him the ultimate green light. I just can't wait to see him with, like, these adults and these grown men. You know what I mean? And and, and to truly see his role as that guy coming up, coming off the bench. And I, I think he I think he's going to have a bright future. He, he seems like a cool kid. I, I also am a little nervous. He, he seemed a little cocky 
over the summer league. He was a little cocky. I don't know. It's just he's not talking like the rookie IQ. Jeremy, like, what was it? Was it cockiness? Maybe was it confidence? Because like I, I saw someone who like had a year's worth of NBA experience under his belt, and he he and Obi had that great connection. He he made some really nice uh, reads as well in general. Uh, yeah. That one pass to McBride as well, yeah. kind of not really yeah. behind the back, but like yeah. it, it was kind of a no look. Yeah, like that sort of thing where it's like I know I'm better than here and I, than everyone I'm playing against. Pretty much, I shouldn't be here, but I'm glad to be here. Sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know. I I, kind of, I loved it. it. It was yeah. I no, it was I get it. Having fun seeing Emmanuel quickly you know, playing basketball. You know again. what? It's my Knicks PTSD because I'm just Fair like, enough. if you New York can do it to you, man. New York being the guy in New York, the uh uh, uh what was he 19, 20, 20 year old kid. All the girls are on him. He's starting to get a few dollars in his pocket. I just don't want the New York City hype to get to his head. That's it. So when I just, I just want him to bring it down a bunch, just a tad bit. And um, <laughs> no, nah, but I, I love IQ though. I, I love his game. I love that he's very family oriented. I, I think he's great for this team. And I just, J- can, Jeremy, can you imagine having your second season in the league? You're learning every day from Derrick Rose and Kimber Walker. Like crazy, Derrick Rose being probably one of the best scorer and point guards of all time, like one of right top five, ten, and then a guy like Kimba, who's I don't think there's anyone on the planet who's ever said a bad thing about Kimba Walker, right? So you're learning humility and grace every single day. So you mesh those together. If IQ could just learn from them and take a, just a few bits from each, I think IQ is going to do really well his second season and moving forward. Obi Toppin ceiling. <sighs> Obi got me nervous, Jeremy. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I, there was times where I'd be fuming watching Obi Toppin last season because I just want him to play with confidence. He looked like at moments a deer in a headlight, and mm-hmm. you know I get it. He's playing behind an All NBA guy. He's barely getting men. I get all of that, but it's just certain things you he. The way he looked out there, he just didn't look like a a, a, a a ready NBA player. He didn't look ready, and I I think I think of course his ceiling is, you know, I wouldn't even say Amari, man. I, I his ceiling for me, this is a tough one. I don't know. I I I, I think we need to package Obi, man. I think we need to package Obi, man. I, I, I'm just not there with him yet, man. Even throughout the summer league, I just saw, I was just watching and I was like, yeah, he's doing well, but I, I just pray he does this against real NBA talent, man. Not one guy that he did anything crazy on or in the summer league was, would probably be even playing the NBA this season. And yeah, it was, it was amazing to see, but I just, I really just want Obi to get some confidence under him. I need him to, and the shot's getting a little better, but he's probably not going to get it off. He's probably going to be a little too nervous to even shoot that in a real NBA game. Um, I just really want Obi to, to, to be working on his game like right now. And I, for ceiling, I I think it's 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 a like another six man, right? Some some guy coming off the bench that's going to give you some athleticism um, and and give you about ten and ten and ten, right? And that's that's great. And at the same time, I think we need to sell why. While the stock is high, and I'm just not sold on Obi. And right. I know your 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 y'all family is gonna kill me. The comments <laughs> are gonna kill me. But I'm sorry, I'm just not sold on Obi right now. I'm not. Well, do you, do you see more of like a John Collins type situation, but for cheaper than what John Collins is earning next year and the <sighs> four years after that? I'm not. If I'm not, I don't see that. I don't even see that. Mm-hmm. I don't even see that. And and it's 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 really because. If you look at like a Scotty Barnes when he was out there in some league, right? And of course, we haven't seen a game yet. But if we look at even like a Ananobi, right? Like when you watch them play basketball, there's just no there, there there's no scared in them at all, right? They play with a fearlessness that I think is needed as a a big man kind of perimeter big man guy, right? And I just don't see that in Obi, and I just I just really think that he needs to get that chip on his shoulder. I think Obi is – I know he's he's had like a, a, a real unorthodox kind of journey into the league, but at the same time, I think like somebody – like Tibbs needs to scream at him one time, 
Right? Like somebody shake them up. Like shake them up because it wake them up, you know? And yeah, I'm t- I just, I, he's a Nick and I pray that he does well. I'm, you know, I love Brooklyn born. You know what I mean? I love Brooklyn guys, especially when they get on the Knicks. At the same time, man, it's, it, I, I think this year I need to see more. And regardless if it's 10 minutes a game, I think I, when he's out there, I think he, need, like, I want to see Obi how he looked at the last few games of the season. If we can get that Obi for the whole season, I'm, I'm down for it. Sign me up. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, the first thing is, it kind of read my mind in terms of the Obi top and a a package situation. I mean, look, the Knicks are clearly committed to Julius Randle and they're not trading Julius Randle. As we were discussing a little bit before the show, uh, you also don't see the Knicks playing Obi and Randle together. You see more of a traditional rim running five who can defend the rim and, and the perimeter as well. Yeah. Staying with Randall. So it's like, where do you find the minutes for, for Obi? But I think the other thing as well, and, and we haven't considered this yet. And um, you tell me, I mean, you, you're a dad, but <laughs> Obi's going to be a dad this, this yeah. fall. So Alec Burks, he harnessed the dad power and went off. Fred Van Vliet, he did it too. So yeah. maybe fatherhood's what Obi needs to, you know, kick him in the, in the pants. But I actually, I kid, but, but at the same time, you know, yeah. Different motivations. It's, I'm sure it's different. I actually agree with you, man. People, you know, then there's people that's going to be in the comments, I'm sure, or screaming at me like, yo, look at, don't look at the blah, blah, blah. Look at the X and O's. Look at, and it's like, sometimes it's, this game is mental, man. This game, that's why I'm really excited for like a guy like Kimba Walker. Just coming to the Knicks, being a fan of the New York this whole, you know, his whole life, it's just going to do something to him. And I agree with you, man. He now, he's going to be a dad. I think that's going to put some extra, you know, extra uh, an extra battery in his back. And I, I'm glad he got his first season out the way. There will be times where Obi would look out. He'd be out there. And he'd look starstruck. He'd look like he'd he'd look like he's just he's been watching these players all his life. and He's just happy to be here. All right, cool. You were happy to be here the first season. I don't care about that. When they when you're out there, it's kill or be killed. And I think it's just time for Obi to step into his manhood and. Yeah, having being a girl dad, uh, that'll, it'll do it to you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and the last one here, um, whether the Knicks should trade all of them for a superstar. Um, I mean, I don't see a situation where all of the young players go for, you know, a superstar. Yeah. Probably a few of them are left out. But I guess, you know, let's, let's call it some type of mellow package, right? How comfortable are you? And that, I mean, I, I take it to have to be the right situation, but, but are, you, are you comfortable with that? Or do you want more of an organic, let's see where we're going with this and then we can figure it out later sort of approach? I, I, I swing on the pendulum. I'm going to be honest. Um, I know in order to truly win in this, in this league, it's a superstars league. You're going to need a superstar, right? And I get it. I think the issue that we have sometimes as Knicks fans is that we fall in love with every person that puts a jersey on. We all thought Landry Fields was that guy. We all, Landry Fields has not touched a basketball in the NBA since he left the New York Knicks. Neither has Alonzo Trier. Ne- right? Like, we fall in love with these guys and we think they're the guys and then we never want to trade them and we hate every- when anybody even talks about trading them. And I'm not, I'm not that guy. I understand that. Listen, if, you know, we have Kimber Walker, we have Derrick Rose. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a bit older. But IQ's not gonna get that much. That, he's not gonna get the minutes he got last year. It's just not gonna happen. You think he'll and, have less or fewer minutes? Right. He's gonna get. He, yeah. He 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 for sure may get fewer minutes. Obi's again because we're playing for something even more this year. He's not gonna get the minutes. Why do we keep them and go so hard to 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 keep them on the team when there's a guy available like a Damian Lillard? I know you have your thoughts about Dame, and I know it may not even be possible, but I'm just open to talking about a superstar on this team. Whether it happens or not, cool. I love the unit we have. I think we're going to have a really great season. At the same time, I think we can't fall in love with everyone. Every team that has, has, besides maybe the Suns, every team that has succeeded in the playoffs within the last 10 years before they got to that point, they had to give up a few players that they love, that the fan base, it's just the name of the game. So I'm open. I don't think we need to do the mellow package at all. But if it's like OB quick and like two first rounders for someone really good, I'm down with that. Yeah. But I'm not trading the whole starting lineup. And that's what we did for mellow. I'm not doing that. Right. But I sometimes you got to. 
you have to, I learned, someone said this to me, Jeremy. They said, sometimes you have to give up what you have to have what you don't. And it's just the name of the game, you know what I mean? And I'm, stop falling in love with the Alonzo Triers, man. He's never touched an NBA floor again. He can't even go to arenas, probably. Like, it's just, he, we can't fall in love with people all the time. It's just not possible. Yeah, I feel like it's just a general rule of thumb as far as like anyone who was here during the Steve Mills era. It's it's over. It's, it's fine. over. You know, Frank Hive is it's gone. I'm sorry. Rest y'all. in peace, unfortunately. But Rest yeah, you know, fine. that's that's just the way it is. So we already know that Michael K. Williams uh, is a, is a you know gone to Knicks games. Knicks fan, it seems. Is there anyone else from the wire? And this will kind of be our transition of sorts. Uh, who would who we would be surprised is a Knicks fan? Oh, man. When I go to the Knicks games, it's literally like a wire reunion. I promise you. Uh, so uh, the last time I went to the game, someone I saw that would probably surprise you all was Clay Davis. He was at the game. And I was just like, oh, you're a Knicks fan? Like, it's just for some reason, the cast members of the wire love the Knicks, right? Of course, y'all know. Uh, Hassan Johnson, he my guy, you know, Weebay played my dad on the show. He's at every game. Michael K, of course, is like the voice of the Knicks now, right? Uh, yeah, it's 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 really cool to be there and see the, you know, it's like a, a an alumni of sorts, right? And it's cool to see that we all like love this team. And anytime we go, you know, I'm sure you all know that Mike Breen is probably one of the biggest fans of the Wire ever. I've literally. Mike Breen, the first time I met him, and I promise you this, he was like starstruck when he saw me. And I'm sitting there like, please, no. Like, I'm starstruck. Like, one of the greatest announcers of all time. And he, you know, just just to have people who care about the show in that way is always special. For sure. Well, I, I want to tap into Andrew because... Um, yeah, bring Andrew up, man. Andrew did something... Lita! Impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you want to tell... The people well, so yeah, just, watching what you did. I'll jump in. First of all, Jeremy, I'm a little disappointed that when he said Clay Davis, you didn't go. She well, I was going. I didn't want to interrupt, <laughs> but that's why I was. Nah, thinking, it was, I was that would have been a first worthy, thing in my mind, but worthy interruption if you did. So, Julito, when we originally were looking for guests for while John is away, we yeah. thought about getting you on so we could finally talk to you because we've seen The Wire and yeah. love the show, and it's one of the all time greats. And we're about to talk about it. And so to prep, because I figured Jeremy would call me up for some of this, uh, I decided I'd just put on season four, refresh my memory with an episode or two. This was yesterday at about noon. And maybe 10 minutes before you logged on to join us on Zoom, I finished the season four finale and successfully watched all of season four in about... 28, 29 hours, which wow. was a very good life decision, if I may say so myself. Uh, it remains my favorite season of the show oh, as well, which is not just, I'm not just saying that because you're here. If Dominic West was here, I would still <laughs> probably say that season four is my favorite season. And I, maybe a controversial take, partly because he's not in it most of the season. Yeah. Um, anyway yeah, uh yeah. yeah it's it remains incredible television and i'm sure i'm sure you get that a lot what's the number one thing people say to you uh is it anything close to what i said or uh first off thank you that means uh-huh. so much to me man uh 28 hours you watch 13 episodes you, you you're mad <laughs> it you made mad sense man. you know um, <laughs> <laughs> um i probably get like hey you finally cut that hair huh i get that probably they okay my hair, <laughs> yeah my hair became a character of its own for sure. I was, uh, yeah. So, man, the Wire fans, just like Nick fans, man, they're some of the smartest fans. I hate the word fans. They're smartest supporters ever. They know the show front to back. They know every character. They know every scene. They teach me things. Um, it's always a pleasure when someone stops me and talks about the Wire, for sure. So, do you remember the moment you kind of realized you were part of one of the more important television shows Ever? I mean, was it was it on the set? Did it take you time to really reflect on it? Because um, I mean, this was before also social media. So yeah. for a lot of these shows today, they can see instant reactions. But uh, pay per view, it's a little different. How did it go for you? One hundred percent. No, um, it's interesting, man. I, you know, I have on my podcast. It was the first time I had brought on all four of the guys, and we talked about you know our experience uh the cor- all four of the corner boys mm. and um we talked about how when we were on set man we had no idea They're like 
we I was fifteen, you know, Tristan was sixteen, the rest of the kids were you know, the rest of the guys were fourteen and thirteen. We were kids, man. We had no idea what we were going through or what we were experiencing. It was it was like summer camp for us, man. We got to do something we love with friends. And now I continuously have the moments where it hits me and I'm like, oh snap, this is wow, right? Um, you know, my latest experiences during quarantine, I was able to I wanted to do something to support the folks who were going through it, who needed a friend, who needed just people to be around because we all had to be in the house. So I decided, you know, I'm going to do a wire watch party where every day from we're going to do it for five weeks. Every day we'll watch two episodes and I'm going to put out a Zoom link and whoever shows up, shows up. And it was probably one of the best experiences of my life. How many people did you get in? Every day would be 200 people at, Jeez, at, at wow. minimum. Every single day. And I, w- I started to bring on some of the... I brought on probably every actor from the show. I There was even a time where I brought on the hair and makeup team. To, Jeremy, to, where were we? I, I, I don't know. Time, every time I tell people this, they, they, they're they like, where was I, right? Um, And then season four, when we got to season four, it was the first time since we we wrapped the show well since the premiere of the show that all four of the boys got together to, you know, like we've never been in the room together since then mm. all four of us and it was the first time we got together and that day it was two thousand people of course um and <laughs> and it just hit me every day how we how I'd do it we'd have like a quick talk we'd watch the two episodes and then we have like a kind of a talk back and just to hear people how much they care about the show how and in, how intel like how much the show means to them to hear like their just analysis of the show. It just hit, there was moments where it hit me and I was just like, wow, like you don't care about shows like that, right? There's only maybe two handful of shows ever that you'll have people 15 years later talking about it. And yeah. Yeah. yeah and like to that point, like obviously the show the word important i i hesitate to use it often especially when analyzing sports in general because yeah. like how important can sports be even and, right. and art <laughs> is the same thing yeah. um but I, it's like pretty obvious that the wire is an important show and the things that come after it are because of the the wire and the things it inspired um you mentioned that this experience i guess with the the watch parties was that like the first time it hit you that you were on one of the more important shows? Or did it hit you earlier in life? Yeah, there was a moment. Um, so this woman walked up to me. She couldn't speak English. And she's just like, right? She, she's just like super in shock. And I thought she would needed help or something was going on. And she brought like over a friend who to translate for her. And she told me that like, in her country where she, she was here in New York visiting and in, in mm-hmm. her country, they would watch the show and they couldn't have HBO. HBO was illegal in her country, actually. So they had, oh, wow. they would send the, the wire DVDs, the bootleg version through the cities to watch it and how much it like meant to her, how much it saved her life because it taught her so much and it, it, it allowed her to have empathy for for people for especially my season for kids and in that in that moment it just hit me like you know you can do things at times that you you don't understand the impact the ripple effect it will have and i've had so many moments like that man so many people i mean when obama when david simon sat down with obama (laughs) and talked about how it's his favorite he he let him interview him right because it's his favorite show and you know our president was able to you know, talk about that and him, him, uh, you know, saying Omar lines, right? Like oh, how God. important that is. And, you know, The Wire for me, it's not a TV show, man. It's, it's Shakespeare. You know what I mean? It's, mm. it's, 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 uh, it's literature. It's, 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 it's necessary. And, and I think that's what it always hits me here and there because I, I, it was deeper than just like, oh, they we're watching a cop show. It was, it was more than that. And I think people have, you know, it, it's hit them the same. Do you feel that the show's legacy kind of has only grown since streaming began? I mean, it must, right? It, would you say that a lot of people more so now are, are hitting you up maybe before yeah. uh, or during the pandemic than before? Yeah, they, I actually saw an article where they said The Wire kind of 
its viewership revamped during quarantine because now everybody had the time to go back and, and binge it again and watch. And man, yeah, I think like you said earlier, we did, we weren't out during the social media era. So I, I didn't really get to see people's natural reaction. Um, but now that I be where people are watching again and I did the wire watch party and I, I was kind of able to see it live and direct. It's, it's just remarkable. Like I said, you don't see 15 years later, people still talking about a show probably every day, 15 years later, right? Like you just don't see this stuff, man. Yeah, Jeremy, I have a question not to like go off course of not interviewing Delito anymore, but <laughs> Jeremy, so how old were you when you first saw the show? It was last year. It was during the pandemic. Oh, it was during the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. No, so it, was, it was the sort of thing where, you know, like before it, I was like, I want to watch this show. But like at first, it was like The Sopranos too, and other shows where it's like, it seems so daunting and you just dive into it and then you can't stop. And before you know it, you're absolutely hooked into it. And I left watching The Wire feeling like this is probably the best TV show I've ever seen. Bingo. And, and just like... there. To kind of tie it to to the relevancy of what was going on, I was admittedly watching it during a time where with Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and it kind of yeah. coming at the forefront. And a lot of it, you know, felt it, it resonated. Yeah. And, and yeah. look, I'm I'm not a person of color, clearly, but yeah. it was the sort of thing where I could I could recognize like this really fits in with everything and it shows that nothing or, or very little has seemed to change. I mean, with everything with Amsterdam as well, and, mm. and just the all of it, just how it tied in. It felt like it was the same exact time, and yet we we had advanced and we really didn't. Um, yeah. So what did, I, what did you, you know, say um, nothing changes, only the players, or something like that. Yeah, something like, like that. that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the game stays the same, man, and yeah. it's unfortunate, right? Especially my season is so heartbreaking because there's so many name and Bryce's that yeah. are like going through the system as we speak. And there's so many, you know, systems that are in place that just are not supportive for a naming to succeed. And thank God we got bunnies, right? <laughs> I well, know so, John, John's going to listen back to this. Like, what are they talking about? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so like to your point though, there are a lot of naming prices, but my bigger takeaway is, and the reason I, well, so first of all, the reason I asked you, uh, Jeremy is because I think, I think, you need to have some type of a critical mind in order to understand why this show matters. Because as much as McNulty or Bunk or Omar or Stringer and Avon or even like Naaman or anybody else that is a main character in a season, like the main character in The Wire is the city of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And it's they picked that area to focus on five different elements that fuck up an entire system. And while there are Naaman's that are going through it and have these personality disorders that are never diagnosed because the city never supports the schools the way they need to, there are also a lot of Randy's. There are also a lot of Michael's. There are also a lot of Duquan's. And it's heartbreaking. Like the throwaway lines in this show of when I forget his name, the trainer that uh, that, that was Randy. Cuddy, Cuddy, Cuddy. So Bad Cuddy. Home. When he's scooping up the kids and he's like, come on, you got to go to school. And they're like, no, he only he already got his day this month. And like Baltimore has this law that kids just have to go to school for one day one of day. the month to get credit for going to school that month. And in like what universe is that real? And it just it, yeah. it really like season four hits home that as much as like there's there's violence or whatever going on on the streets then the docks in season two uh we we see how this affects white people too um <laughs> then in politics you know that's the focus of season three and you're thinking all right well the system screwed up and then season four hits home oh no it starts at the schools it's literally a a, a detention in in school to then pathway to then ending up with no other solutions but the street. And I I mean, it just, seeing it over the last 24 hours obviously hit it home even yeah. harder. But like the legacy of this show, I guess I, I ask you now as a part of that legacy, what do you feel the legacy of the show is? I think um, if you're able to watch the show and you feel empathy or you feel that something needs to be done, I think we've done our job. 
mm. right? If uh, but then when you feel that, I, I I charge you to go and do something, right? Because I think the reason David, you, I don't know if most folks know that the Wire got canceled basically every season. Really? Yeah. Oh. Every season they had to fight for another season. That's why in between season three and four, oh, I, I mean, you guys probably won't know. You, I don't. I'm not sure if you watched it live, but. It took, I believe, a year and a half in between. Oh, is, wow. No, I didn't know that. Or, yeah, because it was after season three, it was basically done. And David Simon, he he like he fought hard for season four, of course, because he knew what he was going to do. And see, season one through three, it's, it's, it's like a, a setup for you to under truly understand that it starts with the children mm. and what the system is doing to our children. It is horrible. And I'm going to put it in your face and show you, right? I'm going to introduce you to these four kids and you're going to see them throwing piss balloons at each other and having fun and being friends the first episode. And I'm going to break your heart because you need to see what the system is doing to these children. And I think if you watch that and and you look back and you say, I learned something from The Wire about this system and how shitty it is, I think that the legacy is going to be that it's it's necessary for change. Change is it has to occur. It's, there's no way that this system is going to continue to destroy our youth, which in turn destroys our our, our world, right? Because the children are the future. <laughs> but mm. I I think David Simon is just a genius at what he does and how he was able to tell the story of a city, of a system, and of people, and to humanize people like Bubbles. Right? Yeah, like everyone mm. wanted Bubbles to win. You know what I mean? If you didn't, something is internally wrong, right? You just want it. Like, you're not a spoiler alert, but, you know, when he walked up those steps, right? Like, yeah. if did, if that didn't make you feel like you won, something's up, man. And for him to be able to do that in such an elegant way. And, you know, I re- uh, I'm, I was watching it with my boy, Sean. He's he's a I envy him because he's never saw the show. So, I'm, oh, so you get yeah, to see so it through his eyes. Okay. For the first time. And we got to this the chess scene in season one mm. where there's T he's basically showing you the game, right? Like on a chessboard while he's trying to teach while they're playing check the whole scene, right? They're playing chess they're playing checkers on a chessboard. Mm-hmm. Right? And he's like, nah, man, chess is a better game. It's and he teaches them chess and how important that is to see, right? Like the, the king always stays the king, right? And the, you know, unless you're a smart ass pawn, right? Like just all the the way you, he used words and the way these actors portray these characters, I just think outside of the like the super deep part of the legacy, you're able to see just just beautiful television and beautiful writing. And if you look at it, almost every actor is still working to this day of a, an ensemble cast of like thirty plus. And where do you see that on any other show? Like, yeah. you know, you just don't see almost every single actor still out here working. And well, it's beautiful. Well, I don't know how Jeremy experienced it when you watched it last year. But so I watched it, I think, three years ago. But the point is, like, after college, like after I had learned how to critically think, um, right. that's when I had watched The Wire. And like you mentioned, humanizing characters, like the way my heart broke, already knowing what was going to happen to Bodhi. And then it happens to him in the last episode. Let me, like, let me I, give y'all a quick oh, go ahead. story about that. Quick story about that. Day. So uh, that day when they shot that scene, every like all the cast members came to, to the set that day to support him. And literally, so I don't know if everyone knows, we shot the wire in the middle of every hood we was talking about. Oh, wow. And I knew it was on set in Baltimore. I didn't realize it was yeah. that specific. And every, yes, so there will be drug dealers selling their drugs and they'd have to pause so we could shoot. And then when we say cut, they go do their thing. And then we're, security had to say, all right, we're about to start. And they come back and we start shooting again. Right? It was that real. But that specific day where outside there were hundreds of people watching this, like people pulled up lawn chairs to watch this. Like, and I'm not talking about the actors. I'm talking about the neighborhood. They all came out and we sh- yeah, it was. Man, shout out to my brother JD Williams, such an amazing guy, amazing friend, and he's just just watching Bodie. Just it's, mm. it's that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Dang, we got you. You were on the show, and you're already getting like you're getting, you're reacting to it away. Hey, you know? I don't know if you both know. Did you I'm, realize in that scene what occurs? 
which scene the one that he where, spoiler yeah. alert the one we've where he already, gets killed, we've already had that's that's true, the one where he gets killed did you see how he got killed though by well he got killed by the the by, way that snoop and chris taught the uh the guy no, that actually, oh that, so what happened that and the way that the kid he got killed like the pawns on the chessboard on the chessboard oh so the guy killed him he went he walked up and then he turned left like I don't know chess that well, but I, I believe would that be a rook, Jeremy? Or is that a knight? What if he's turned? If he's if he's making he wants, the left, if the, he, the bishop would go left. Yeah, right. He, so. so the kid who kills him, he walks front, and then he goes in the direction of. But that's oh, then then that's a pawn. Yeah, because the pawn can only go straight. Oh, wow. But then when it takes its piece, it Remember, goes diagonal. And, and while he's while Bodie's shooting back, he can only shoot forward. He never turns around. Like a pawn. Once you go forward, you can't go. This the show is crazy. Bro, that's so next low. I can't. Jack. Next level <laughs> writing. Next. I kid you not. I just saw this an hour ago, and you next just made it. Writing wow. just blew my yeah. mind. I don't even know what the next question is. Well, I just, I, I'll, I'll just mind. say like the the one thing that I always love about writers is how they're able to start something and then tie it all together, so it feels like the whole story comes full circle yeah and like so you telling me that it, it's like that completely it makes me rethink so much yeah. of what we've seen and, and just reevaluate that's that's awesome so um, have you seen game of thrones i did uh i'm gonna act like i didn't watch the last season but I did. <laughs> uh so I the last season. same okay <laughs> so what was it like watching Carcetti, uh, Carcetti, <laughs> be little finger for little seven finger. seasons. Oh, uh, it was cool. It's so interesting. Um, so my season, I was when uh, Carcetti was kind of one of the leads mm -hmm. as well, and I didn't really get to know him that well. He was a very, how can I put it? A very, he wasn't as boisterous as most of us, and he was very to himself. And uh, he's so he was little finger, is what you're saying, right? He was very much like little finger. <laughs> he was actually preparing life. for the role ahead of time. <laughs> yes, he's a he's a big uh, method actor, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it was extremely weird watching Carcetti like set up everybody in Game of Thrones. And yeah, I love Game of Thrones. I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. I just like I said, I'm gonna act like season eight didn't happen. What's what season are you talking? What are you talking about? See, this, they Khaleesi comes to Westeros, and that the show ended. That's it. I the show's yeah. over. Yeah. yeah, I don't even want to. I can go into a long, some some really strong takes I have about that that last season. But I well, we don't want to get you in trouble because yeah, you know we'd like to see you I'm in to be a spinoff. Yeah, something on yeah. HBO. So there you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm curious though. Did you, you know, in terms of prepping for the role, mm -hmm. were you able to interact with a lot of these people in Baltimore who are on the street or did the, did the cast or the, the crew rather, they kind of keep you more separate. Like in terms of training, did you also, were you looking into more of a, a like the Baltimore on accent? What was the whole process like in terms of preparing for it and, and, um, and being name and Bryce? Yeah, it, it was actually a really swift process in a sense. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you this and I've said it many a times in my, you know, the rest of the boys will attest to it. The Naaman, Michael, Dookie, and Randy wouldn't be what you all seen if it wasn't for Robert Chu, who played Prop Joe. So mm. what occurred was he w in real life, Robert Chu was uh, he was the instructor in like one of the biggest acting schools in Baltimore at the time. God rest his soul. He's, he's moved on. But David said, I'm going to put these kids with Robert and Robert's going to teach them like how to embody characters, how to become kids from Baltimore. And we so we'd be with Robert just working with him every day. He'd be on set with us every day, even when he wasn't working. Um, he really was, the, the you know, the guy who brought these characters to life for us. Um, and I, I owe him everything, right? Because, you know, I think when, when people praise the kids, you have to praise Robert Chu as well. And yeah, it was. It, we didn't get to spend a lot of time with the kids prior to uh, getting the show, starting the starting the show. But of course, you know we we shot those scenes, especially those school scenes. We shot those with real Baltimore kids. Like all those extras were real Baltimore kids, and they acted like real inner city namings and and Michael, right? Like. <laughs> 
they, it was real. E- even the girl that gets cut up, like is, was she an actor or a Baltimore? She, she kid? Was, yeah. So the kids who had lines for the most part, they probably came from Robert Chu School. Okay. So they were kids who were trying, who were acting. But even then, they were still kids, right? And they were still like you know inner city kids, and it was just it was funny, man. It was they, I, you know who I feel bad for, <laughs> uh, Presbo. Oh. Presbo would get it, man. They we, we would really treat him like Presbo in real life. <laughs> I you swear can't. to God, just Damon walks up to him. Fuck you, just like yeah. <laughs> people. It, it wasn't that mean, but like people, like he really had to sit in those classrooms in those early uh-huh. season and like deal with 30, 40 kids all day. And uh, you know, he he Jim True for us. He did an amazing job. But uh, yeah, we 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 really did our best to truly learn the characters. And I think the the script and the writing and the work did it. It did it for us, you know. I also thank Ed Burns, uh, one, one mm. of the writers and producers, who he sat with us for um, every day. We, he'd be right there, right next to David on set. But David wasn't very uh, communicative I, I, or boisterous, or you wouldn't. David can scare you sometimes, okay? David Simon can be very scary sometimes, okay? So you're not going to just walk up to David and start talking to David Simon. But Ed was a lot more uh, calm and, and more chill and. He he's the guy who also was a very uh, pivotal part of these kids coming to life for sure. Mm. So I've got to follow up to that, but before I say it, I, I just want to say um, one of the moments I think that really breaks my heart as well. I mean, we've like had spoilers littered yeah. everywhere throughout okay, this, but man. if you so if you haven't if you haven't right, right, by this point, it, you can um, literally do it in an entire day. I promise yeah, you, exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, like there's a moment where Duquan, I mean, he's on the computer a lot. And then there's one moment where you see what's on the computer screen, but you actually have to like rewind and, and pause it because it goes by so quickly. And when you're watching HBO Max, it takes like an hour because the app is just so bad. Yeah. Uh, but and you just see on the screen about how it's like Mr. Presbo's class and, and what he's designed. And then you, you know, you see what kind of becomes of, of his life. And it just like it, it tore me up to think. You know, you're in this situation where this kid is just excelling so many ways and the system just fails him and yeah. and he can't he can't cope. And yeah. uh, it was it's just yeah, you know, the heartbreaking. Ripple of, the, rip, the ripple effect of the system failing people was tremendous. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, Dookie, of course. Right. Mm. And then you even look at Randy and how heartbreaking that is, is because. He was asking for help. See, it was a little different for Dookie because Dookie didn't know he can ask for help, mm. right? But Randy was actually asking to help me without saying those words, but he was asking. And they literally ignored him, right? So you got one instance where a kid who he doesn't even know it's possible for adults to support him until he meets Presbo. Then you have another kid who's been through the system for years and he knows what group homes is. He knows what snitching is. He knows. And he literally just does things to try to survive. And he's asking for you to support him and no one's listening because they'd rather care about a tennis ball with the camera inside of it. Right. That's just that's what occurs. And it's it's heartbreaking. Yeah. When I watch, because I don't really watch the show too often. Um, I've watched it in its, in its entirety, maybe three times in my life. And uh, when I watched it over the quarantine, there were scenes from like Randy and Dookie in particular I couldn't watch. Mm. Like I literally had to look away from the screen because it was that heartbreaking. What is it like to see yourself on like just that before Jeremy asked his, his last question? What is it like? As you said, you saw some of Randy and, and Dookie scenes. Are you able to see some of your performances now? So you can't watch Naaman because you know, like, oh, that's I, me. Very, very, I very little. Do I watch of myself on anything I've done? I don't. Oh, know. Okay. I'm not sure if I don't like the way I look. I don't know what it is. I hate my voice. I don't. I just don't watch myself over. It's it's very it's very weird. Uh, but no, I I, I think I did watch a, a lot of it during the quarantine during the while you watch party because it was just so good. Like it was so good. And honestly, y'all, I talk about the show as if I'm not on it. So when I'm speaking, mm-hmm. it's not me being like cocky. I'm really just a fan of this show. Well, we're a part just, of it though. Like, say that's, that's, go ahead, Jeremy. No, that's just so much of, of who you are and what you were molded by and how you're able to, to just revel in all of this. I mean, it's, it's not cockiness. It's just you yeah. 
yeah. being and it's part also, of something that's it's awesome. also was my childhood you know i didn't mm. grow up with like many pictures and so if it wasn't for like me being an actor i wouldn't necessarily have uh uh an opportunity to look back at my past, especially my childhood. So when I watched like that kid, it reminds me of like what Julito at the time was going mm. through. And it, there was some really good times and there's just some awful times. So it's a lot of history when I watch myself back on things. So I, I don't do it too often. Of course. Well, the last thing before we go into a speed round is, all right. So David Simon, right? In his terrifying, menacing ways, he calls you up and he says he wants to do a spinoff featuring Naaman Bryce. Uh, What's Naaman doing right now? Uh, oh, is he, is he still tight with anyone from, from school? Is he, like, what does his life look like? Um, where's he at? Yeah, I, th- I think, uh, if anything, him and Donut, the, the car thief, they're still good. I think they're, they're now... Whatever name, I think I, I can see Naaman doing something in a political field, per se. Mm. Not necessarily like running for office of sorts, but he's like a leader in the Black Lives Movement, right? Like he's, he's, he's really being a voice for the movements that we need voices for. So I can see him doing that. And I can see Donut, Donut being his homeboy and being, and, and, and like support him through that and doing his own thing as well. Probably his driver, right? Because he loves cars. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> With um, a car that Naaman owns, of course. In and a car right? that Naaman yes. owns, uh, of course. And yeah, man, I, a spinoff, man. I think about it sometimes and I'm just, you can never do it. And I, I actually probably hope they don't do it because you just don't, I don't think there's things you need to touch, right? Like I don't, too many TV shows and movies have have been like the history and legacy of it has been kind of ruined because of people just being greedy, right? Capitalism. But I think the wire was perfect as it is. But if I had to say, I would say he'd be like the leader of a Black Lives Matter movement somewhere, or maybe even a school teacher. Bingo! You beat me to it. I was gonna say that's who I think where yeah. I think Naaman is. He be, he went to like University of Maryland and. Yep. Came back to Baltimore to be the teacher that Presbo was. That Presbo you know? was, yeah, yeah, and you know, it's it's so sad I, when I think of like where would Michael and Dookie be? That's just and mm. Randy. Yeah, I'm just like I I was I, I was also really blessed to have a character that had a happy ending, and I think it was necessary for you to see that, right? Like there are some people who care enough about these kids to help them get through it, right? And Thank God for all the bunnies in the world, right? And even the Weebays, right? Mm-hmm. Because if it wasn't for a Weebay allowing a bunny to, to care enough about his kid, right? To love him enough to say, I'm going to let him go, right? We wouldn't have had that happy ending. So I'm, I'm grateful we do have those people on the planet as well. Yeah, my, my girlfriend, she's a school psychologist here on Long Island. And like, she's a bunny. You know, she's a she's a bunny Colvin looking to make a difference. She's a Presbo. And yeah. the, the the frustration she runs into is that like there's not enough of us. There's just I can't be there for every kid. Yeah. They leave in a couple of years and my jurisdiction is kind of gone. And in certain cases, by the time they get to me, there's the damage is already done. And uh, yeah, that's if you've never seen. Well, at this point, you've seen The Wire because we're we talking spoilers. <laughs> at least season four. For yeah, sure. if, you've, yeah. if you've I, I just recommend people go back and rewatch it if you haven't. Yeah. It's it's a fascinating piece of just art. And like the reason you can't do a, a spinoff of The Wire is because it's called America. You know, just turn the news on and there's your spinoff of The Wire, unfortunately. You One know? of my favorite lines of the show was nobody wins. One side just loses more slow. Presbo. Yeah. Presbo, He's watching football. Right? Let me watching tell you, Presbo. Football. I'm a Jets fan. One Come team on, loses. Man. Come okay. on, man. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, like, that's the game, man. And you don't need to do another wire because just rewatch the show. Bingo. That's it. You'll see exactly. It's, there's, there's nothing new about it. It's everything that's happening right now. But, uh, uh, Andrew, if you don't mind, I'll ask you yeah, a really quick. I just want to know, did you learn anything? Did you see anything new or learn anything new when you rewatch it? This oh, like today? Hours? Yeah. So, yeah, literally today. <laughs> um, I mean, I was able to pay attention to some knowing what's coming. Like, you know how when like when you watch The Sixth Sense for the second time, you're able to pick up on other things because you're not really paying attention to the story. You're paying attention to other filmmaking elements. And 
like I recognized the like what's happening in the schools is also happening in the in the uh, the courthouses and it's also happening in the police departments and yeah. it's each level being infected and you see the process that everybody goes through. Um, I mean, I just how would the kids that they cast were like, not to throw more shine on you, dude, but uh, you and Maestro and Tristan and Jermaine have incredible chemistry. I thought you were four <laughs> kids that grew up uh, around the same age. There is one thing, and I asked you this before the show, and I'll, I'll bring it on before we get to speed around. So you weren't in charge of your wardrobe, right? No, no, I wasn't. Okay, uh, so yeah. explain this to me. In, in episode two, you're wearing a Yankee shirt and a Yankee <laughs> hat. In episode four, you go visit Wee Bay in prison. You're wearing a Mets coat. Yeah. Uh, Naaman's from Baltimore, apparently. So <laughs> explain what, what that was, why that I, happened. Number one, I just th- think he was just very fly. I just think Naaman just had okay. fly. And uh, no, I think, I think they were playing on the fact that n- – Wee Bay's character, I don't believe he was born and raised in Baltimore. I think, uh, you know, he got caught in Philadelphia, so he had family out there, and I'm guessing he was more of a New York Philly guy. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I just think you know, I did not have any say. The only say I had was that I wore a Jesus Peace earring on the first episode, because at the time in Brooklyn, you was the man if you had a Jesus Peace earring. It was very big, obnoxiously big. It looked crazy when I rewatch it. But I did wear that, and that was my personal earring. So I had to beg David to let me wear it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but that's it. Nope. The, the wardrobe stylist, shout out to my brother Juan. He, they, did, they did an amazing job. He still has that Minnesota Timberwolves jacket. Really? I wore in the scene where both when me uh my Naaman's mom brought her Naaman back to the corners. Yeah. And, and then but what he, um, what he Naaman, call it the dragon lady? <laughs> yeah, Naaman's mom, man. Oh, that was heartbreaking too to watch. Yeah. yeah. Um all right, Jeremy, you ready to do a speed round with uh with Julito and Naaman Bryce? Let's do um, it. I just shout out to David Simon, incredible show, but yeah. if you're going to wear Yankee stuff, you can't then wear Met stuff two, <laughs> two episodes later. My only, here I am, nobody on a podcast offering critique to David Simon. Hey, anything <laughs> but wearing an Orioles, you know, jersey. Or, that's the other thing. Like, you know, I no Cal wore, Ripken jersey, nothing. I never had a Ravens jersey the whole show. Yeah, they won the Super Bowl three I had a Chicago Bulls. <laughs> they did. I had a Chicago Bulls jersey, Minnesota Timberwolves Dude, jacket. You, you Everything walk into school on the first day with a Raider jersey on. Raider jersey. Yeah. Raider like, j- yeah. I'm so I confused. get it. Like, the style was in. I under. I yeah. just, at a certain point, it's like, huh, I know he's yeah. from New York. Did he just say, uh, anyway, yeah. go yeah. go watch The Wire if you haven't yet. Okay. <laughs> first answer that comes to your head, we're going to go back and forth. You ready? All time favorite Nick. This is not a speed round. Come on. Land on someone. You got this. One player. Carmelo Anthony. There you go. All right. I got oh. I got the flip side of it. All time least favorite Nick. All time least favorite Nick. That's yes. that's the question in front of me, yeah. He who must not be named. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Oh, a different favorite. number six. I thought you were gonna say the number six that plays in Dallas now. Oh uh, no, I actually don't care more about Alpha Payne than then Bingo. The the least fun I've ever had watching a basketball player is that he will also not be named number six, indeed. Um uh all time favorite non Nick. Derek Rose. Yeah. 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 Well damn. He's a Nick. Yeah, now he's a Nick now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um I really loved watching <sighs> damn. I watch y'all. I don't know if, about y'all, but I literally don't care about any other team on the planet. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna be honest. I, that's fair. That's it, fair. I don't care about any other player. So I'll just say Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose. Before he was a Nick. Yes. So then, Jeremy, the next question. <laughs> yeah. Current favorite non Nick. Yeah. Current favorite non Nick. Yeah. Uh, Is it Reggie Bullock? Yeah. A former <laughs> Nick. <laughs> no, I like somebody. Why is it not coming to me? Um. Are you a Dame guy? Because I know we had gone yeah, back before. Thank so you. Dame. Sorry, okay. sorry. Yes. Damian Lillard, yes, is my favorite. Yeah. I'm, I love Dame. I'm I, yeah. I'm a huge fan of Dame. Uh he's a dope rapper and he's the best point guard in the league. Jimmy. Bingo. Ooh. 
I was I almost put on here. Do you have a hot take about the league? Putting him as the best point guard in the league is one. He's the best point guard in the league right now. Okay. Yep. Shout out Steph Curry, who doesn't exist anymore, apparently. Oh. Okay. <laughs> That's the next podcast, don't worry. Um if you could cast yourself in the biopic of any I'll I'll stick with the Knicks of any former Nick, who would it be? Carmelo. You want to play Carmelo Anthony. Carmelo okay. Anthony. I love his story, man. Uh kid from Brooklyn, moved to Baltimore. Oh wow! Uh, totally, totally forgot the Baltimore aspect yeah, of it too. Wow, he's Baltimore at fifteen, and and just what he's done in his career, and he's such an amazing guy and person, and yeah, I'd love to play Melo one day. Who would you say is the goat of all time? Yes, Michael Jordan. Okay, uh, you're you're closer to me in age, of course. It's going to be MJ. <laughs> all right, Jordan. we transition out of basketball. Your all time favorite movie of all time? I am Sam. Wow, that is a movie I don't normally. He- I am Sam. We'll am talk Sam. after the pod. I want to know why. Um, Jeremy got all time favorite actor. There's Sean Penn, one. Denzel. Okay, I was gonna say Denzel. Sean Penn. Is that gonna no, be no? Not Sean. I love Sean, but okay. no, not Sean. Uh, all time favorite director. It's between Spike Lee and Ernest Dickerson. Wow, that. Deep cuts. Go ahead, Jeremy. All time favorite wire character not named Naaman Bryce. Oh, man. So many. Uh, but Avon. Avon. Okay. What wow. What Harris. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Big one. Mount Rushmore of HBO shows. I'm assuming the wire is going to be there. Yeah. I would put the wire number one. So this is going to, I don't know. This may hurt a few people. I've never saw the Sopranos. Same. <laughs> oh, there we go. I, but we get crucified because everybody we else do. has. Yeah. Yo, David Futternick, he, he's literally been trying yes. to get me on his <laughs> podcast for like two years. Dude. And I, he's like, watch it. Can you watch it, please? So you can come with a podcast. Well, so, I'll speak to the people Jerry. who have seen The Sopranos. I'll just say shame on you both. Shame I on us say, both. I yeah. mean, listen. My, don't worry. I, my boy, Sean, he, he literally, every. I just shot a movie with, I'm so bad with names, but she played. The, the the girlfriend and the Sopranos. Jeremy, you know the girlfriend of the, Christopher's girlfriend. Christopher's girlfriend. Okay. Oh, um, Adriana. The Adriana. Adriana. Yes, yeah. I just okay. shot a movie with with Adriana. So I met her, and my boy's starstruck, and I'm sitting there like I don't know. <laughs> uh, Entourage. Number okay. One. The Wire. Number one. Entourage. Number two. This is going to be a hot take. How to make oh. it in America, number three. Oh, wow. How to make it. I've not, I haven't seen that. Wow. Damn it. Only did, it was only three seasons. I loved it. You're I you're leave. leaving. The, you have one spot left, and there's some heavy hitters not there. I know. I know. <sighs> I feel like we should all... After you get done, I feel like we should... Yeah, pause, please, you know, all all of us else. should do this. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, though. Your last one. And it's only HBO shows, right? Only HBO. Yes. It's between, of course, Game of Thrones. Okay, I'll just Thrones has to be it. Okay, yeah, Jeremy. No, that's not the order either. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You just yeah. went. Uh, no, it's man. Mount Rushmore. They're all equal. You're good, Jeremy. All right. Uh, the Wire, Sopranos. This is the thing. Like, I I really enjoyed Game of Thrones, but I can't put it. Wow. Mm-hmm. They fumbled. The, they fumbled at the one. Like you can that's say the thing. it. Yeah, yeah. I you know it's With so Marshawn great. With Lynch though, also. Yeah, it's like yep. they called the wrong play at the one, literally. Yes. Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, all right, if we're sticking with the wire uh, with HBO, um I love Barry. Like, yes, oh. it's get it's growing on me too. It's, but I, I need to see case. seasons three and on, but yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Um and then the fourth one, man. Um I'm trying to think of what I like I saw White Lotus recently. It's good. Fine. Mm-hmm. Not okay. definitely not gonna crack my rush more. I also have not be. seen Curb. Oh man, that's, okay, that great. one I'm mad at you for. Okay, okay. Uh, I, it's okay. Next, I'm actually finishing Entourage for the 50th time, and I'm respecting <laughs> it. <laughs> so I'll start with like Entourage is on mine. I, I, Jerry Ferrer, if you're watching this, come on the next film school podcast because yeah. I have so many questions for Turtle, and yes. I, I would just like to nerd out about. Like yeah. movies in general uh, yeah. for whatever, however long. Yeah. Um, so The Wire, Entourage. 
Um, curb. And then. So I'm understanding that. Or at least respectful to the fact that the, the Sopranos will probably make mine when I do see it. So Same. holding that, like reserving that spot for the Sopranos is on there. I'll say uh, Silicon Valley, wow. which just I I laugh at everything Gilfoyle said for a couple seasons. It hasn't aged great because of yeah. um, T uh, T J Miller was that his name? Yep. Yeah, he's just not a person I want to watch. Also, they also fumbled it the last season. I mean, you know, I didn't hate the last season though. You know, I, I get it that it's not it's not perfect, but I mean, yeah. what am I going Could Hard Knocks be on the I haven't seen it. It's before yeah. my time. Uh, it's like uh, right before The Sopranos, so I just missed it. You know, watch Oz. I, I, I do have to catch it. I have to watch the I believe last two seasons, but the first four amazing. Mm-hmm. Oz is really good. It just couldn't crack my Mount Rushmore, but it's really good. Jeremy's point about oh, what am I? Succession would take the place of Silicon. What am I doing? Succession is absolutely in my. It's two seasons in. And it's two it's seasons in. It's this. It's honestly this close to already passing Mad Men for how great. It's the closest thing we're ever gonna get to like a Trump family documentary. So as a result, it's it's that it's good. Kind of- it's I mean I really enjoy it. It was just mm-hmm. the sort of thing where I wanted to love it so much more than I have, and I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to season three. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and there's some incredible moments in there that just are hilariously funny but um yeah i don't know and with silicon valley it's like i felt like every single time it's like oh we're encountering the same problem that we had like two episodes ago and we miraculously figured a way out of it i still have no idea what pied piper is (laughs) to this day watched five seasons still have no idea what pied piper is what it does like you know it's behind his ear and then he yeah i won't won't (laughs) say watch the show and you'll get it yeah (laughs) Um, do, do we have time to just? I just gotta hit go ahead. Top, top three shows of all time. Of all time, wow! Uh, the Wire, Breaking Bad, and so like we're not limiting this to dramas, right? Like no, I have no, no. then The Office. Like it, it's, I knew, I, I yeah. knew you were my guy. I I, it, it. It's a like what The Office. I don't think people realize what The Office did to the genre. Every single television show had the audience or the laugh track. You were cued when to laugh. Then The Office comes along. And I'm sure like other shows were doing this, like the original Office. The Office with Steve Carell came along and changed like every single show is like uh, uh, Parks and Recreation, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia. All no them. longer need to have the laugh track uh, format and the office, it, it changed everything. So, there we go, Jeremy. There we go. You took all the words out of my mouth, this is and that's also my general. Top, that's in also general. my top three. That's also your top three. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not just saying this because you're here, Julio, but I'm gonna say The Wire mm-hmm. is, is in those top. Wait, those I three. said The Wire, right? Hold on, yeah, you did. You okay, did. good, yeah. just making sure. No, you did. Um, okay, I gotta say the second, I tend to shift more towards uh comedies, I just naturally do. Mm-hmm. So, um, Seinfeld, mm-hmm. I've got Seinfeld above curb. Okay. But if we're talking HBO, then obviously. And then um, the third, yeah, I guess I got to go with The Office. Like at this mm. point, it feels cliche. And I almost watching I know, shows again, yeah. like yeah. I almost find myself gravitating more, find myself gravitating more towards Parks and Rec mm-hmm. uh, or even Community than I do The Office. But I know I can also just sit down and watch The Office when it comes on Comedy Central or if I steal my girlfriend's Peacock uh, account. <laughs> yeah. And I can just watch it and chill and don't have to follow anything. Isn't weird. it so whack watching it on Peacock? It is. Yeah. Is it, I, I, I had deleted P. I try. I downloaded it for the Olympics and then I didn't never knew how to watch it and just said, all right, listen, I, I would, I would have it on loop on Netflix just all year round. Mm-hmm. Every time I, just, it's just, it's, it's, yeah. The, the office is to me, actually the, all I put the office one B and the wire one A and my, of all time. I, and fair. Jeremy, he's saying that because he knows he can't put the wire any lower than one. <laughs> <end>. <laughs> I'm not. No, I just think for drama and for comedy, the way mm-hmm. that they, they, they're they like synonymous and Steve Carell, probably the greatest comedic performance ever. 
It's almost underrated at this point. Yeah. What he yeah. does for like seven seasons on that show. I even seven, stand for the Robert California season. season. Yeah. Oh my. The last two seasons were character de- development. That's yeah. the thing. That's yeah. the thing. They were great, but you got to know more about who they are. Um, I feel like if we had a fourth slot for shows of all time, if that's what we're doing Rushmore, mm-hmm. I think I'm putting Shit's Creek there. Um, yeah, my girlfriend loves that show. I have to watch it. It, it. It's funny. I'm like, like I'm... I think I just got to get a lot of TV you gotta, now. You get, like yeah. the season three, it's then you I like can't stop. It. Uh, but the only fact, two, did you guys okay. know that the office, the creators of the office, Greg Daniel, he's one of the biggest Wire fans ever. Really? And yeah, and he literally the reason Holly is Holly. It just elbows. Uh, yeah. Every, yeah. every time that they would have a guest star, he tried his hardest to find why characters from the Wire to be on the show. Because they loved it so much. And yeah, I found that out from listening to the Office Ladies podcast. Ah, there you and go. Community Shout and Michael K. Williams. Ah, there you go. Yeah, K. So, yeah. I mean, I don't think that wasn't Greg Daniels, I don't think. It was Mike Schur. It was Mike Schur, but yeah. 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 They know they, they the good actors. All of them, though. The, all the writers, all the creators, uh, all the producers, they all like lived and breathed the wire. Yeah. One thing I'm hoping as a result of this episode, Julito, is that like obviously we talked Knicks at the beginning and we we sprinkled some Knicks throughout the pod, but like there's nothing happening for the next six weeks for basketball fans. So, you know, we've now given you some homework, some shows for you to watch, some (laughs) things for you to catch up on and where to watch them. Um, The only other honorable mentions I'll throw in are Mad Men because I binged it. That's the thing I binged during quarantine. Okay. And... I think I would have appreciated it more when it was happening. Like the trip yeah. through the sixties was interesting and waiting for key events to come up and then them to do an episode around. It was cool. But I think I just, I get what they, I got what they were doing, but I, yeah. certain things I don't need to revisit ever again. Um, and then I just Chappelle show remains the greatest Chappelle sketch comedy, show, but I would put it above SNL for greatest cut sketch comedy oh, show yeah, of all time. Of yeah. Without a doubt. This has been a blast. Julito. Thank you. Thank you for this. Yeah. Jeremy, you want to close this? I'll let you close this out. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, Julio, is there anything that you'd like to plug? Well, first off again, I just have to say my, my favorite podcast, you know, besides you guys, nothing but Knicks, of course, Knicks fans TV. Um, my favorite podcast when I want to come and get the analytics, when I want to come and laugh at you and John <laughs> and how your know, chemistry is so amazing. And then Andrew sprinkled in there. It's perfect, man. So thank you so much for having me on. Uh, would love to come back anytime you guys uh, are open to it. And um, just thank you so much. And as far as me, you guys can all follow me on. I am Julito every on every social site and, uh, I got a few movies, a few different things I'm working on. Um, my podcast, you can check it out, Random Thoughts with Julito. It's on YouTube. Uh, my very first episode, I had The Boys of the Summer. or, or Well, Dookie wasn't there. Jermaine wasn't there. But myself, Mac Wilds, and um, Randy, uh, and Maestro, we all came together to talk about The Wire for an uh, hour and a half and our experience of the show. And it was it was, uh, it was it was really good. So if you want to see an enhanced version of this talk, the talk we had here, come over to my podcast, Random Thoughts with Julito. Hey. Shout out to all the Nick Nation. I just want to say this. I actually got introduced to the YouTube verse and the the Nick Nation potters and all that this season. And it's the best thing that happened to me. You guys got, like, besides my children and all the kids, <laughs> you guys have been like my daily dose of just like stuff i haven't watched tv in months haven't you know I, I don't do any other meaningful stuff i was doing before because all day i'm watching nick film school and mm, you know wow. schwinney and the, those guys at strickland and, and and danny the morning drive i'm just watching all of you guys all day but um thank you so much for like keeping the team alive it means a lot you know i i'm really like a fan like for real for real like wow. i remember you know watching you know, just like Stefan Marbury, like be horrible for us. But I'm sitting there like, I love it. He's a Brooklyn dude, right? Like I was there for all of that stuff, man. And it's just really good to know that like there's a real family, man. And, you know, I was there at the playoff game when we won and it felt like we won the World Series, Grammys, Oscars. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that, that means a lot. There's no fans like the Knicks, man. Yeah. So I uh, appreciate you all for keeping us alive, man. Thank you, Julito. Uh, really appreciate you coming on. Um, 
go ahead and follow Julito online. Uh, Julito McCollum, actor, not dancer, not as we've established. Not I wasn't Still Nick diehard Knicks fan. I was a Nick City dancer, though, for like three years. Yeah, I actually was on the team at a point with Stephon Marbury's daughter. When really? Was, wow. Yeah. She, she danced with us for a bit, but uh, I was a Nick dancer, a Liberty dancer, all that. Yeah, it was cool. 